Yeah. I think at least the half of them are from Turkey. Thank you, thank so. you, to all my colleagues. Now, um, I think so um, about the, uh, about the pandemic. Uh, what is happening in Brazil? Everything is okay. Are you all uh, well? Uh, actually, it depends on, on on the place because we have a huge country. So yes, every state has different laws now. For example, I'm here in Goiânia. It's the middle center of the country, and uh, the operations are are going pretty well right now. But it's different, for example, for from São Paulo, São Paulo, Rio de Janeiro. They have more cases of uh, COVID, so it's not uh, that good to, to operate um, there. Is there is there any guess about the, about the progress of the uh, progress of the virus? Is it is it increasing or is it, it's, it's increasing? Uh, in, in increasing. It's increasing. Yeah. And also uh, yes. Uh, more more it's it's really worst in the in the north of the country. And we are becoming the, the center of the pandemic right now. So Brazilian situation, it's, it's quite... I, it's, it's quite I hope everything will be more safe, safer, let's say. Now, yeah. um, mm, I, I, I can share my, uh, my screen if you want, or if you, if you yeah. want uh, any you questions. Could share. No, you could share, you could start your presentation. Yes, of yeah. course, yeah. of course. Uh, actually, today uh, I will just try to not bore the participants. So, uh, we can start first revision or osotomy, which you prefer. Maybe all. Or certainly, maybe we will talk about it and we will finish okay. it. So, sorry. Yes, I think. Actually, uh, of course, uh, uh, for me, to. Um, Two different topics are the most important ones about primary rhinoplasty. First is osteotomy, the, the other one is ailer based resection. Uh, so let me just close the WhatsApp connection. There is uh, some, sorry, I'm just, just a few seconds, sorry. Okay. So Osteotomy and, and base, base resection are a, a little bit uh, needs experience, I think. And about uh, osteotomy, maybe we can talk, of course, uh, uh, let's say maybe half an hour, but I will just talk about eight or nine minutes. So we will use the time more efficient way. Um, it's about manual microso, but of, also, of course, you can ask about the microsotomes or, or anything you want. Uh, it is true uh, for all the steps of rhinoplasty, as we all know, there is not a best and standard technique in rhinoplasty. In osteotomy, the main aim is not only to mobilize and narrowing, but also to control the amount. What I mean with this word, this is a cadaveric left side. There is a more or less hinge point uh, at the junction of transverse and lateral osteotomy line, as you see. So. This is the operating room equivalent of the uh, logic. So there is a hinge, you can mobilize everything, but, but do not collapse. Uh, and what I'm using for osteotomy, uh, man, uh, manual microsoves and small rasps, let's say, uh, microstotum. Three millimeter is more suitable for our population, I think. Uh, this is my, let's say, evolution maybe. First, for, of course, so many years ago, I was using guided osteotomes. After start to micro osteotome, then I, I have met with piezo. I used it about uh, 100 cases, and then I just quit it and started to use microsoves. 
Because so of course it's, a, it's it's just a name. Uh, the the tip is about 0.4 millimeter in thickness, so it is a little bit uh, thinner than piezo, and you can use uh, your just hand motion. Uh, why I uh, I I just quit the the piezo because actually it causes um, any any electrical instrument. Um, uh, cannot use the electricity in an efficient way. More or less, there is heat production. Even you, even we we use solution, etc. So the 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 produced heat um, traumatizes subcutaneous tissues, and there are some callus like re reactions about. Let's say in 100 patient, two or three patient, I had uh, burning effect. Let's say. In uh, three or five patients, I had callus-like reactions. Just because of that, I just quit it because the tips are not long enough. And also, as I mentioned, uh, I have some 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 problems. But there are so many colleagues preferring piezo. Of course, you can use it. Uh, if a, if a surgeon is using piezo, it's better not to touch the tip of the of the instrument to the subcutaneous tissues. Uh, that's it about. So piezo, micromotor, microsov. The thickness of micromotor and microsov is equal, 0.4 millimeters. Piezo is 0.6, but it's not so important. So instead of electricity, you can use just by wrist motion, actually. And like this. This is just to show uh, the motion of the instrument. It is actually uh, the Yes, here you can see the wrist. Uh, we need a stable, uh, stable motion, and the, this stable motion can be provided our wrist, and it it just uh, draws an arc actually. Uh, so the instrument fits that arc. So this is my operating table about last four four years, I think four or five years, uh, and. Uh, the right one, there is an angulated uh, saw. It, it is for rib harvesting. The others, as you guess, media, uh, medial transfers and lateral sotomy. But the, the lateral sotomy one, I'm using only in revision cases. In primary cases, I use microsotomy for lateral sotomy. And these are the rasps, as I mentioned. They are, they, their width is about 2.5 uh, uh, millimeters, something like that. Uh, you can use it for rasping anterior maxilla or lateral ostotomy line or lateral to the lateral ostotomy line. Uh, this is rib harvesting. I just I just put this video to mention that uh, our fingertips uh, we have naturally um, touch and pressure sensation, and you can feel each motion or each millimeter of the motion with your fingertips. In electrical instruments, there is vibration, and more or less that feedback is uh, is decreased. So, uh, you know, Boris Checker is my friend. We have met him many years ago, and he 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 designed the, the concave one, Redix one, and then we just called this family as Tashten Checker Microsoft. These are simple instruments, actually, not so important. So this is. Medial ostotomy, just showing how it works. The, so, uh, as you guess, just provides a gap uh, between the nasal bone and septum that equals to its thickness. And actually, such saws are, they have been using probably 80 or 90 years, actually. This is, this is important. This is the motion of the transverse ostotomy. And I think. The most important thing is this one. This is a uh, real-time video. It takes about 30 seconds to make a transverse ostotomy. Uh, just you have to provide a gentle pressure just to grasp the bone. Uh, if you press too much, you cannot rasp, or sorry, you cannot cut the bone. Or uh, as you guess, this is right side, just showing from inside. This is the motion, as I showed, the same patient. I will show also this patient's closed rhinoplasty video just to discuss the rhinoplasty dynamics. 
if you have time at the end. Endoscopic wheel. This is medullostotomy, as I mentioned. It's, it provides a gap that equals to its thickness. And then again, I'm just trying to show the transvasostotomy. Of course, I'm using both hands, but here just to show with the endoscope, I'm using only one hand. But that is the, this is the circular motion of our wrist. And also the, the angulation of the tips are designed according to our wrist anatomy. Actually, when you, when you take a pencil and just, just make a motion with your wrist like this, it draws an arc at, to the paper, and actually the 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 angulation of the tits fits to that circle or arc. That's it. It's not important. Yes. Uh, this is just to show uh, in in revision cases. I I as I mentioned, I I prefer to use the lateral stotum so. This is the old, uh, old fashion of the instrument about four or five years ago. I'm just trying to mention that if, if in, in revision cases, it's better to mobilize the skeleton in, in the same manner as in the last operation and then, and then start to fixate everything. This is lateral osteotomy. So we have mobilized the on the right side, there is two transverse osteotomies I performed with the saw and also lateral osteotomy with the saw. So in revision cases and also in deviated cases, it's better to, uh, to mimic the, the trauma or to mimic the last operation osteotomy lines and then, as I mentioned, mobilize, then fixate. And how about lateral osteotomy? As I mentioned, I, I am using um, three millimeter microstotum. Of course, there are so many discussions about that. So microstotum causing unwanted fractures, etc., etc. But I think it's not true because if the instrument is sharp, uh, the rest is the rest depends on the surgeon and the nurse. So if the surgeon is using the instrument in a correct way, let's say, I think there will be not such problem. Uh, I'm just showing the lateral osteotomy. I just want you to see the lateral osteotomy line here. Uh, uh, you, you'll see that just, just only a line. So few case studies, as I mentioned, our main aim is to, of course, uh, we have to control the, the amount of narrowing. So, um, the transition between the lateral nas nasal wall and the cheek there uh, if, if if there is any unnatural transition it it, it means something uh, something went wrong with the osteotomy so there must be smooth transition as in natural uh, skeleton these are just for examples uh, so maybe you will not bore about talk uh, i will show this patient's close trinoplasty video at the end, of course, male patient. The uh, this patient is, um, I, I, as I showed at the at the beginning of the talk, the uh, the hinge effect of the uh, transesostotomy and laterostotomy junction. This is the same patient. So, of course, they are different. So, I'm just trying to mention that. Uh, Let's say in in such cases, maybe we have we we have to talk a few words about the hinge effect. Um, I'm just trying to mobilize the lateral wall uh, in a uh, as much as large surface area. Let's say uh, it, it, it means the 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 transverse osteotomy line is nearly at the intercontal line, and the lateral osteotomy is low enough and there is an hinge effect around the transverse and lateral osteotomy junction. So in this patient, of course, it's not, uh, it's not deviated too much. It's a, it's a slight axis deviation, but the right side, I will just rotate the um, nasal bone medially. On left side, we need to rotate laterally. So 
if you if you can provide a hinge effect so you can control the lateral wall if there is if there is any hinge then everything will be just narrowed but uh, you cannot uh, have enough control on the axis of the bones so or in such cases she has really short nasal bones maybe you can realize from here this port region belongs to the cephalic part of upper lateral cartilage so maybe there is one 1.2 centimeters of nasal bone if you if you can control the the movement of the uh, bony segments so you can control the result i think or in such deviated noses and I, I i just try to show this patient's picture to emphasize where i'm using the rasps here you see on the right side of the patient there are protrusions around the anterior maxilla and also lateral to the lateral osteotomy line so i just rasp this area and then of course double transverse osteotomies then uh, it's more or less in midline of course many of such patients have facial asymmetries also as you know so uh rasping is very important uh, in in especially such such deviated noses this is a quote from leonardo learn how to see and realize that everything connects everything else this is my addresses maybe some of my colleagues interested in to to see more videos or something and Okay, so I, do you have any questions about osteotomy? Ah, can you uh, hear? Yes, yes. We just turned off our microphones. Uh, professor, in that, uh, that last case, how do you do that osteoplasty with conventional rasp here before doing the, the osteotomy? This one? Yes. Ah, yes. So, uh, here, um, actually, deviated nose is a, is another lecture, of course. But uh, we, we can talk talk about it uh, shortly. So, in such deviated noses, uh, when we when we imagine a line like this, I mean the lateral osteotomy line, there is a protrusion of anterior maxilla lateral to the lateral osteotomy line. First, I rasp that area, and then uh, if if only with rasping, I, if I think that I can control the the smooth transition from cheek to the lateral wall, then it's okay for me. But usually in such cases cases, it's it's better to first rasp, and then and then double lateral osteotomies. What well, I mean with double lateral osteotomies, there are uh, there is only three or four millimeter uh, distance between the two, two lateral osteotomy segments. So if you, if you make a lateral osteotomy, let's say first uh, the superior one, then, then the inferior one, the, the pyramid uh, loses height at the right side and then more easily corrects to the right side. Uh, I, I mean, so uh, with rasping, most of the problems uh, you can solve most of the slight problems or even such problems but if the, the if the axis devi deviation is more or less prominent or if you cannot control with rasping you can add double lateral osteotomy and i think this is the answer for you yes sure guys do you have any questions uh, dr testan do you do the three types of osteotomies for every patient? So I mean, the, the, which, 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 which type you mentioned? Do you do all, all the three types for every patient? I mean, ah, the medial, yeah, you mean the medial the, like, transverse and lateral osteotomy? Yes. Uh, actually, uh, of course, um, as a, let's say, um maybe 90 percent of cases uh, i always um how can i mention that as i mentioned actually 
uh, I prefer to mobilize the nasal bones as um, as much as uh, sorry that, that's not the right word. Uh, I I just prefer to mobilize the nasal bones as a white surface area. What I mean by white surface, as much as uh, high transverse osteotomy, it means it's about uh, one or two millimeters caudal to the intercantal line, as low as possible lateral osteotomy. So the lateral nasal wall surface area is larger. So even in such cases, if the, all the attachments becomes free, if, if, if such a thing happens, then there will not be any collapse. And also there will not be any, any unnatural transition from cheek to the, uh, to the, to the uh, lateral wall. So it, I, I just prefer, uh, I, and I think it's, it's, uh, it's very important and, and thank you for the question. So if you mobilize the nasal wall as a wider uh, segment, then the transitions will be more natural. Uh, when, when I prefer the transverse osteotomy higher, it means I, I need a gap um, between the septum and the nasal bone. So uh, medial osteotomy uh, provide a gap and sharp angles between the nasal bone and the septum, then transverse osteotomy, then lateral osteotomy. I think it's okay for you. Yes, and j just one more question. How do you deal with uh, very convex nasal bones? Do you do those? Yes, of, course, there are, of course, there are so many variations. Uh, think like this. Just, just imagine that uh, and, uh, a normal, very symmetric nose, a friend, let's say, had a trauma and something changed in, her, in his face. And, and just imagine that you, you just open it at that time and you see the fracture lines. So in such noses, it's better to provide such fracture lines during the operation and then reconstruct it. So let's say uh, there is a, um, how can I explain it? There is a convex uh, left nasal bone, the right nasal bone, let's say. So in, in such cases, if you, if, you, if you use two transverse osteotomies, one higher, one middle, let's say, then uh, imagine the shape as a parenthesis-like shape. If you, if you provide two small parenthesis shapes, then if you cover with the skin, then you feel that it is straight. So in such convex, uh, convex bony wall, first I just rasp the protrusions, then, uh, then make two transverse osteotomies. And, and the other thing, if there is, uh, imagine that there is an axis deviation and uh, you, you want to, um, you want to, how can I explain it? Let's say he has a straight, just, just imagine that he has a straight nose and it, his, his nose is uh, deviated to left side. So we need to open right side. It's of course easy, just mobilize and put feather graft between the nasal bone and septum. But the, but the problem is the, the left side, if the, the medialization amount will not be enough, then even in such patients, you need two transverse osteotomies to close the gap. Because if, if there is only a hinge one, at one point, then you cannot close the gap. So um, two transverse osteotomy logic sometimes works like this. And, uh, and the other thing, if the, if the convexity is, is, uh, is at a different axis, then you can just uh, uh, make two, two osteotomies. I mean, lateral osteotomy and, and intermediate osteotomy. It is just according to the shape of the bone, actually. Um, and... Uh, I think very rarely you need, uh, you need double osteotomies, I think. But in, in deviated cases, in like this one, uh, we can also prefer just double osteotomy here. Rest this area, double osteotomy on right side. That, that's it. If, uh, if, the, uh, if there is an 
convexity in a different axis, then you can use intermediate osteotomy to, to correct the deviation. I'm just trying to show that if the, if, if the convexity is like this, then you just break like this. And then if you cover with the skin, you feel a straight nasal wall. Is it okay? Yeah, thank you. Dr. Tarsten, um, how wide is your undermining in the bony framework to, to use your saw? It's like a full well, open. Um, I'm, I'm in, in routine primary rhinoplasty. I'm using the medial one and the transverse one. And uh, I'm, just, uh, I'm just elevating the, this, just, just the transverse osteotomy area, just, just enough uh, to, to cut because uh, okay. There are, of course, um, different opinions. Some prefer wide undermining. In such a patient, of course, we need wide undermining because I will rest this area, deviated nose, traumatic nose, etc. Et but if the nose is more or less symmetric, uh, it is better to, to elevate the skin just enough for, uh, for using your instruments and for making modifications because there are some um, when we perform wide undermining, we, we also um, cut uh, perforating vessels, something, etc. So the, the edema will last, I think, longer than usual. So if I, if I need rasping this area, I, uh, of course, wide undermining, but usually I, I'm, not, uh, I'm not connecting or combining the dorsal elevation with the lateral osteotomy line. Separate lateral osteotomy, only a, only a very narrow tunnel and separate dorsal elevation tunnel. Oh, okay, good. And I, I have your soles and, and I have some difficulty to, to do the fracture, to, to cut the bone in, in the, in, close to the cantus, to the medial cantus. Do you have some tricks to do that? Because in the lateral, it's it's really it's really easy to do the median, the paramedian also, but right close to the cantos, I feel some difficult. Uh, I don't actually, know; it's my problem. Actually, about the soles, the the most important one is the or most efficient one is the transverse one. We can perform all the osteotomies with any instrument, but when we talk about transverse osteotomy, it is better to use saw. So about the saw, uh, maybe we can check the video again. Uh, sorry. Maybe I will just, it's very easy to find from here. Uh, Can you see if the if the screen is small? Just to show the uh, transverse osteotomy part. Yes, yes. Sorry, I'm just trying to. So, uh, in first uh, first uh, localization of the of, of the transverse osteotomy. If you localize the transverse osteotomy uh, caudal to the intercontal line, let's say two or three millimeters caudally, uh, then the bruising will be, let's say, less. If you are, if you have to make the performed osteotomy around the intercontal line, more bruising. If you have to more cephalically, then much more bruising. So. In usual primary rhinoplasty, if the patient um, radix is normal, if the patient has not high radix, let's say, so usually it is better to provide it about two millimeters caudal to the intercontal line, not not superior it. And uh, and the other thing is, uh, you have when you are um, just concentrate to your um, to your hand, let's say. Uh, the relation of the soul with the bone, you, you just provide a slight pressure to grasp the bone, not much, and just, just a turning motion from your wrist. Um, and, the, and the other thing, the, the direction, when you, 
with your eyes when you see the direction but when you perform the motion actually the the lateral part of the transverse osteotomy line usually um, more cephalically than expected i mean you think that you are performing a correct transverse osteotomy line but when you finish the osteotomy you see that the lateral part of the transverse osteotomy is cephalically than you have imagined did, did, that's our that's our our hands just changes the motion during the during the during the let's say osteotomy so if you if if you are aware of that um, our misleading motion let's say then you can you can uh, also uh, correctly understand the direction in such in such situations let's say this is the left side of the patient in such patients i just tilt his head to left side and a little bit rotate to oh, sorry rotate uh, tilt right side and rotate right so i know that when i perform the transesostotomy even if i think that i'm performing at the let's say what is this axis axial line let's say when i finish the osteotomy i i, I know that the lateral aspect of the transesostotomy line will be more cephalically than i imagined so just um, from after this talk during the first operation just first uh, uh, just uh, imagine the line you, you you want to perform the osteotomy then just watch your hand motion uh, and then i think the the direction is important i think the missing the the, the missing thing is if if you have any any soft tissue particles at the tip of the soles then the soul will not work so uh, you have to you have to elevate of course superiorly um, and there must be only bony surface and your uh, micromarker so the teeth must be clean uh, and then you have to feel the that you have to feel the 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 grasp of the teeth to the bone if there is any sliding motion uh, it means there is a soft tissue between the teeth and then just just clean the teeth oh okay I hope thank this you is i think it, it will help me and when you when you do these three osteotomies you do first the medial then the transverse and then the lateral is this yes, the order yes, yes okay. yeah, this is the order okay Do dr Tastan, uh just one one more question it, it doesn't have to do with the osteotomies but could you share with us how is the solution that you use before the surgery? Because your surgeries are very bloodless. Just, just curiosity. Actually, I, I have tried many many combinations, but at last just just turn back to the uh, to the classic um, adrenaline and and lidocaine solution. Uh, it is it is already uh, already ready in the in the packages. Let's say. It's one over one over one one hundred adrenaline, uh, so uh, only with the uh, I'm I'm not uh, I'm not adding any any solution to the to the local anesthesia. I think of of course there are there are different options. Some of my colleagues uh, uh, using different mixtures. I think the most important thing is when you when the patient lies on the operating table. Uh, the patient's head must be uh, elevated uh, upper than his or her uh, heart. And also, um, it is better to, um, to uh, inject the local anesthetic solution about three parts, let's say. First, I'm using only, just, just, just imagine a big circle. First, I just inject uh, the the infraorbitals here, and then maybe some here, and then just wait five or eight minutes, something like that. And at that period, the nurse prepares the the patient, and then I uh, I, I just start to the second part of injection. Then then a smaller circle, 
then then at least if I need then to the incisions or something like that. So uh, during the lateral osteotomy, just separate from from this talk during the lateral osteotomy, I just inject uh, about ten minutes previously to the lateral osteotomy, lateral to the lateral osteotomy, and also medial to the lateral osteotomy line. And if I'm I am try, I am uh, planning to perform base dissection at the end of the operation. Again, I inject only to the to the bases at the end of the operation. So um, the most important thing it's better to divide it into three parts, but at least two two parts. First, the big circle, then the smaller circle. Maybe about eight or ten minutes in between. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, we have a lot of questions uh, yes. at the Q and A. Do you wanna? Uh, maybe. What, what do you, What do you think? Maybe we we can go on with the the lecture and then ask, answer all of them. Uh, yes, the of course. Ends. Of course. It's so um, about revision rhinoplasty. Uh, actually, the. The, the main logic of the talk, or at the end of the talk, I'm just trying to mention these two, two topics. So uh, the, the main determining factor is quality of skin and mucosa, that's it. And, and about the skeleton, it's the most important thing is dome. Uh, it's very important the dome is intact or not. So if the dome is intact, then more or less, you can behave as a primary rhinoplasty. If the dome is destroyed, dome division or something uncontrolled maneuvers, then it is uh, one. It the 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 result will be one step lower than 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 expected. So the the dome is very important. Is it if it is intact, everything will be easy. So of course, main uh, main uh, aim is to restoration of function and form. Autolog tissue. I'm using only autolog tissue. There are enough autolog tissue areas: septum, ear, rib, composed ear graft, fascia. Um, first, I will show two sim simple or relatively simple cases. Let's say just with auricular cartilage. Uh, she had uh, two previous surgeries. Um, when we open her nose, you will see that there is a, uh, the, the left lateral wall more or less collapsed or more medialized than the right one. And there is, an, there is, a, um, there is a medial osteotomy line, maybe you can fill that gap. Uh, so the medial osteotomy, medial oblique actually, the medial oblique osteotomy line didn't um, perform from the correct uh, location. So, uh, relatively thick skin, maybe there are so many thick skin patients, but uh, according to us, her tip skin is uh, relatively thick. Of course, there is uh, facial asymmetry. You can realize that uh, mouth corner, base, everything is down uh, on left side, inferiorly, I mean, and the bases are different. So, and, uh, Somebody injected uh, here, it's um, really unnatural. So in, in, in such patients, we will, of course, correct everything, but we will cover with the same skin. So in uh, the, the skin uh, thickness is, of course, very important for the result. So in this patient, I'm just trying to show the ear cartilage harvesting. I use this anterior approach. Uh, the, the perichondrium, elevated with the flap. It's very important to protect the, the quality of the, of the flap. Now I'm just resecting the grafts. So I prefer to uh, harvest the Simba Conca and Kavum Conca separately. There will be about two or three millimeter intact bridge in between here. So it will, it will provide the the resistance of the auricula, so there will be there will not be any uh, problem at the postoperative period. I mean, the 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 auricula preserve its shape at postoperative period. 
and I reject posterior periconium with the cartilage, but anterior periconium is with the flap. You see there's a resistance and it, it, the, the shape uh, will be same at the postoperative period. So when we open the nose, you see the dome is intact. It means it's easy, but at the lateral aspect, you see the, there is, uh, they performed uh, resections and we need, some, uh, yes, just, uh, just see this area. You see this medial oblique osteotomy line and the left nasal wall collapse medially. And we need a gap between right nasal bone and septum. So I will use Microsoft to reject a small wedge of uh, bone from here to provide a gap between right nasal bone and septum like this and then reconstruct with of course photograph something like that you know but this this area is important this, this the left side as you see there is a there is a fibrous tissue actually and the rest is bone first i provide a hole to the nasal bone with a needle then i just fixate the spreadographs And the thickness of the spreadograph isn't enough. As you see, there is only a scar tissue uh, because they reject, they perform the osteotomy line a little bit lower than expected, more obliquely, I mean. So I just inserted a piece of bone between the septum and the um, spreadograph. So spreadograph lateralized. I just cover with the fibrous tissue. Then th that area uh, is more symmetrical, let's say. And uh, small alar button grafts, and then uh, small infraroblar graft or shield graft, let's say. Uh, about the tip grafts, of course, we need more stronger okay. skeleton in such patients, but uh, two layer tip grafts works well. But if you try to um, uh, use three layer graft, then the, there will be absorption. So it's, it is enough for two layers. Not, not more than two layers, do not use three layer grass. This is only um, soft tissue rests to, to increase the tip projection because I, I, I have used all the grafts, only have these ones. And also I use two layers of only a graft and she has thick skin. So in such patients, it's more, uh, more easy for us to use rib graft actually, because you can easily rib graft septal extension, etc. So you can hold uh, such a heavy tip skin uh, with, uh, with a strong support. Um, so if you hesitate between rib or auricula, it's better to, to use rib, I think. This is just an, just an uh, experience. If, if you are hesitating, then use rib. This is only dice cartilage graft to camouflage the dorsum. Uh, and fixating the uh, super tip skin, so closing the gap be the, between the super tip skin and the skeleton. I think it's it must be okay. So this is more separative. So. Uh, I have only pictures of this patient. I, I, I didn't put the, put the video, but I just tried to show that uh, uh, she, at the postoperative period, she had a secondary healing around the columnar incision. There is a, about four millimeter of a bridge here with scar tissue and uh, open roof, et cetera. But the, the tip work was, did, was, didn't perform correctly. So, uh, a little bit re relatively difficult from the first one because her dome uh, was not um, was not enough intact. So with ear cartilage, uh, two two or three millimeter of uh, scar resection from here, but not uh, but not um, all of them because then the the columnar skin will be uh, shortened. So. It's basically a tip work, actually. Now we can start with cartilage. 
Uh, do you have any questions about ear cartilage or or the or the previous patients? Okay, about rib cartilage. Uh, uh, do you have any questions? I'm okay, doctor. Okay, I'm going. Going okay. Um, so, in the past, actually, the costal cartilage was required for dorsal only graft, but in time, uh, with uh, with the structural grafting, the the indications have expanded. So, uh, some of our colleagues uh, hesitate to use rib cartilage uh, due to risks: pneumothorax, postoperative pain, scar formation, working problems. Of course, all already you know. So. When we talk about rib, this uh, this is the seventh one, sixth one, the free edges, uh, eighth one, of course. So this is a cadaveric rib segment. I I usually prefer sixth one or seventh one, according to the dimension of the cartilage. The what is the difference in between them? Uh, the, actually, they have relatively straight segments, but seventh one is the harvesting, the seventh one, is more easy than the sixth one because uh, under the seventh one there is there is abdominal structures, but sixth one is is a neighbor to the of course to the lung uh, or, or or pleura, so um, it is a little bit relatively easy to har harvest the seventh one, and uh, and it's better to uh, to reject the Maybe this area is more easy to, to explain. I'm using the right side because I'm right-handed, but this is left side. I'm just trying try to mention this area is, um, is the, uh, how can I explain that? Actually, uh, we, maybe we don't have time to talk about it, so it's better to mention here. Uh, the this this junction areas about one one and a half one and a half uh, centimeter segments. This I think this area's structure is different, so they 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 relatively uh, preserve their straight form even um, which technique you use in even which technique you carve the graft. This area this synchondrous region sorry this synchondrous region. Uh, try to preserve its straight shape. So uh, I, I just reject this area in an oblique fashion here. So first I measure how long uh, the longest graft I need. Let's say 3.4 centimeters. Then I, I imagine an, an approximately 4 centimeter of segment like this. Then parallel to it 1.5 centimeters away, let's say. Uh, so, uh, another line here, then then reject the segment. So the red one is balanced cross section carving. The blue one is oblique split method. Uh, just to just to explain the um, the the logic behind it, we can carve the carve this graft in three planes: coronal. Mm -hmm. um, Coronal, axial, and sagittal plane. Um, coronal plane means actually the the balance cross section carving is coronal plane. How can I? If you, can you see that? Yes. I mean like this. Uh, if you cut like this, it is more or less axial uh, axial plane, and the the sagittal plane is not not exactly sagittal, but sagittal plane is more or less our oblique split method plan. What I mean with that. When we see the cross section of the graft, uh, this means axial. When uh, and and coronal is the is the balanced cross section way. way. I, I mean in 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 anatomic position, just uh, curving like this. So, what is the difference? Ah, yes, when we talk about uh, axial, if the if the cut lines are like this, it means axial. So. When we talk about the stability of the of the graft, the uh, the balanced cross-sectional carving method, I mean the coronal plane, it is relatively less stable than the axial plane. Axial plane, this one, is relatively more stable, and 
uh, the sagittal plane, this one, this one is more stable one. So this is oblique split method. This is the, uh, the, the, the classic balanced cross-sectional carving method, I mean coronal section. And axial section, as I mentioned, uh, uh, when we uh, when we um, talk about the stability, I mean preserving their shapes, coronal is relatively less stable, axial more stable, oblique split the most stable one. Of course, if you are experienced about rib, you can use. Uh, each of them, it's, 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 it's not so, so important. And, and if, if you are aware of the affecting forces, if you are experienced, and you, you can easily use the coronal section. But for young surgeons or for obsessive surgeons, the, the best plane is the, the more or less sagittal plane, I mean oblique secret method. So I, I think I have showed this one. I am using this, the, this angulated so for harvesting rib, I first cut the lateral and the medial segment of the plant resection segment. Then I provide a gap like this. Then the rib will become more less um, less resistant. Then I can easily elevate the posterior preconium. And about um, you, you can you can harvest the rib of course from one centimeter but uh, I'm just trying to show the uh, endoscopic view of the this is the eighth one this is the seventh one endoscopic rib harvesting helps us only during um, during to show the posterior pericondrium maybe 10 seconds or for educational purposes but the best thing is binocular vision and binocular work and uh, about, I'm not uh, sure, but maybe 12 or 14 years ago, I performed uh, endoscopic cases, but then I just realized that um, the, the depth of the view is not as natural uh, as a binocular vision. So uh, it's about, sorry, uh, maybe I can, yes. So, few words about the incision you can what will be the minimum dimension what can be the minimum dimension of the incision the in the incision have to be enough large to take the rib out what i mean it's about one centimeters if if the if the incision is less than one centimeter then you cannot uh, take the rib out because the the diameter of the rib cannot cannot burst, let's say, from that hole. So, but if, if the incision is about one centimeter, there will be more uh, flap trauma. So at postoperative period, there will be more scar formation. I think 1.5 centimeter incision is enough. Uh, it, is, um, it, is, uh, it is small enough, but also the flap edges will not be so traumatized. For relatively less experienced young surgeons, let's say, actually normally it's it is enough to two centimeters. But uh, if they feel themselves a little bit less experienced, then three centimeter is enough. More than three centimeter, there is no need to cut three centimeters. The location of the incision, you just palpate the direction of the rib. Usually it is about 45 degrees from the midline. In, uh, in, in children and also thin women, the, the angulation is a little bit more vertical. So you just feel the direction. And from the sternum or from the, from the cystoid process, about, uh, let's say, first 10 to 12 centimeter is rib or sorry, cartilage. So, uh, I just, uh, it's very important to localize the lateral aspect of the incision at the lateral aspect of the plant resection segment of rib. I mean, this incision uh, line localization is nearly same as the 
uh, as the graphs, the segments, lateral edge, I mean, the, the, the idea under it is you can easily uh, shift the, or, or move the flap medially, but you cannot, you cannot move the flap laterally. So about the exposure, it's hard to, hard to uh, move the flap laterally. So it's better to, to localize the incision like this. And we can go on. It's about 1.5, I think. Then after the incision, subcutaneous tissue elevation, then we reach to the rectus fascia. You see the fascia. Uh, it's very important to repair the fascia because if you if you do not repair it, the patients feel more pain. Now the muscle fibers are intact. I just incise the fascia, and I will just uh, provide the gap between the muscle fibers. I I'm, I, I didn't cut the fibers. I just dissect a window, then reach the anterior perichondrium. Then I perform the parallel incision to the rib segment, elevate the perichondrium. Now I'm just I'm just performing an oblique cut to the lateral aspect of the planned resection segment, as I mentioned. So with this saw, it is about one millimeter in thickness. So I can feel every movement of the teeth. I can see the depth. This is the medial part of the uh, segment, as you see. I just it means it, this so provides a gap uh, that equals to its thickness. Then I, I easily elevate the posterior perichondrium. Then after elevation, I'm just taking the segment out. This is the summary. Lateral aspect, I just cut like this. Medial aspect and elevate with such an instrument. So as I mentioned, it's very important to use both hands and binocular vision for depth perception. The segment is about four centimeter in length. And this is posterior perichondrium to test there is promothorax or not. Uh, that's it. So about prevention of graft warping, uh, I think um, if if Gibson and Davis didn't uh, didn't study this um, the the characteristics of the of the rib the the affecting forces rib behavior etc et uh, now we we couldn't talk about probably uh, we couldn't talk about uh, rib how can I express it. I'm just I'm just trying to say that I have respect to the to the previous scientists, philosophers, or surgeons. Uh, did they really good job? So we can we can do better things with the help of their knowledge just uh, collected uh, in time. So Gibson mentioned that the only definitive method to overcome cartilage warping is to avoid cartilage carving. He's just trying to say that if you touch the cartilage, you just um, make a disequilibrium between the forces, affecting forces, and the cartilage changes its shape. Of course, we need straight graphs. This is balanced cross-section carving method, carving the periphery using the center, or of course, you can use uh, different layers. As we talk, this is, uh, you can take the balanced balance cross-section carving method as, as coronal section, let's say. Uh, this is, uh, I think, um, this is the misuse of the technique. The surgeon didn't understand the philosophy, uh, what did Gibson mentioned. And when we, he had previous, uh, two or three previous sinoplasties, at the last one they used rib segment. As you see, they just carve in a desired fashion and then just in, in insert it. So, uh, so it changed its shape, of course. 
she had, uh, I think, four rhinoplasties. During the third and fourth one, they used rib cartilage, and uh, both of them worked like this. When we take the dorsal ulnar graft out, its its shape is like this. This is this is about not the technique. This is about the surgeon's experience because they just copy the the, the shape of carving. They they didn't concentrate it about uh, about the equilibrium of forces because if they if they have read the paper from 1958, they will realize uh, they will they would realize that Gibson didn't set uh, such an such a carving. So. What uh, other authors performed for prevention of warping? Uh, Gunter inserted Kirchner wire, or a colleague from, uh, yes, the name here, a laminated dorsal graft. Uh, he, he was using cadaveric cartilage, two different centers of ribs, then, uh, the, then they face to each other, so their um, bending effects equal as each other, etc. So as you know, dice cartilage in fascia, Daniels, uh, actually this is only a filling material. So from uh, another author, he used uh, multiple uh, transactions to, to cut the affecting forces. And an, an author from mm, Turkey, he also performed the same method, but he didn't aware of this method. Just, just coincidentally, uh, from a different part of the world, you can think the same things. So rhinoplasty surgeon needs straight graphs in varying thicknesses. This is oblique split method, just uh, splitting the rib in an oblique fashion. It, it means using the cross section as a as, as a graft. So um, there are some further details in the article, but uh, most of them, I, I'm talking most of the details now. So when we talk about a graft, you can carve it into rectangular shape, etc. About the uh, equilibrium of forces, actually, um, there are central cells tends to expand. There are peripheral cell groups tends to tends to contract. So if you, let's say, bevel this lateral edge, it means you decrease the contracting forces on this surface. The other surface contracting forces will be stronger. Then the graft turns, slightly turns to the other surface. So if you, if you perform the same maneuver, maneuver at the center, it means you are decreasing the expanding forces then the, the graft tries to collapse uh, or tries to be concave at the surface. It's a, it's a general information, of course. Just in, when you are using rip, and just imagine that uh, the, the periphery tries to contract, the center tries to expand. Let's say if you just, if you just cut this, this uh, edge, it means you just um, destroy the contracting forces here then the expanding forces will become free so the cartilage the cartilage will turn will turn this side if it is on the operating table the surface will not detach from the operating table but just turns to the other uh, other side very very slightly so it's better to use the whole segment as a graft just put on the operating table and uh, carve it symmetrically as much as possible. Let's say if there are 100 patients, I try to always mention this idea, if there are 100 patients, they have uh, more or less behaving different, 100 different ribs. Um, I mean, each patient's rib behavior is um, more or less different. Of course, it is. It, it has a little bit ossification centers. It, it means uh, it will keep its straight form, but it is. We, we do not like such graphs for to lateral coronal reconstruction. But if the if there are clear borders, if the periphery is the the color of the periphery and the center is very different, it means 
uh, when you curve the periphery, the, um, the, the bending forces or the control of the bending forces will be a little bit difficult. So it is, it is important to behave symmetrically. But if the morphologically, if they have whitish surfaces, let's say in young persons, young patients, then you can curve, uh, you can cut, uh, how, how can, uh, what can you want? Because they, the morphologically similar uh, surface um, uh, keeps its straight form. So uh, this is about cadaveric study. They, are, they keep the straight form. It's, it's the summary of that. This is about uh, from the animal study. Different angles keep their straight form. This is the obvious method article, as I mentioned. This is a very old video, maybe 10 or 12 years ago. This, this is just for convincing you. So I will just, um, this very thin segment, one side is paper thin, the other side is a little bit thick. I will left it to dry on the table. The drying surface will contract. So I will provide an artificial bending or warping like this. Then I will immerse it into a solid solution. Then you will see that the cartilage will become straight again. This is just for to, to, to confuse or cheat your minds. So you can easily, um, uh, easily convinced that uh, the graft keeps its straight form, but, uh, but actually we just artificially bend it. And now when, the, when it becomes uh, hydrated again, it becomes straight. So obviously the method graphs stay straight. And about, as I mentioned, I just draw, uh, draw an image there and this is, do not use like this. This is only only a mental exercise for you. If the blade is curved, then if you if you cut very homogeneously, then you have curved grass. But please do not try this because if you curve or if you touch uh, from now on, then it will bend differently. If the blade is straight, of course the graft is straight. This is with the curved blade. I I just uh, used it for uh, to prepare our lateral coral strut grafts in um, uh, more or less ossified segments. But as I mentioned, uh, do not use the curved blade, just, just straight blade with a, with a dermatome blade, uh, just straight grafts like this. It's better use like a strong dermatome blade, just cut it in desired thicknesses these are shapes, they will keep the straight form. There are, ju just, just imagine that all of them four centimeters, many four centimeter of grass in such a small rib segment, even you can perform two rhinoplasties. All of them are straight four centimeter grafts. And they are flexible enough. If you cut it uh, thin, you, it, it, it's just, uh, it's really flexible enough. And how can you provide a curved graph for lateral coral reconstruction? Because we just cut straight graphs. Actually, I just mentioned previously, if you just carve very gently the periphery of the graft, so the, the other part will become stronger, then the graft becomes a little bit curved to the other side. So it's very important to use curved graphs for lateral coral reconstruction. If you use straight graphs for lateral coral reconstruction, then the patient will have um, external nasal valve problems at post period. So you can provide all of the graphs from a single segment of obic split method graft. You see here, I'm not sure, yes, 4.5 centimeter of graphs in this patient. Uh, but in, Estrat reconstruction and dorsal only graft um, unit segmental segmental reconstruction. Uh, usually, one one piece is enough for septal, uh, caudal septum, but you can use uh, you can use two different grafts back to back. This is from the from the article, so 
in in that times about more than 10 years ago i'm using a little bit thicker glass but now uh, for many years i'm using now only one millimeter thickness of rib cartilage is enough for for the resistance of the septum so one millimeter thickness is enough if you use thicker glass it just uh, obstructs the nasal passage that's it so i think there was an article from turkey about the strength of the cartilage i i couldn't remember the remember the author's name so one millimeter costal cartilage strength is enough for the usual septal cartilage dorsal negative you can use side by side end to end etc like this or you can overlap them but it's very important to to prevent the step here you can camouflage with a rib pericondrium um, in this patient and this is from article as i mentioned septal reconstruction performed the caudal um, the columnar strut also i just fixated to the caudal septum so it will behave as a as an uh, caudal extension graft dorsal layer graft at lateral aspects you see costal pericondrium just to provide a smooth transition from lateral valve to the graft in such patients, in, if you are using a rigid on graft, it's uh, important to camouflage the lateral edges with dice cartilage or crushed cartilage or soft tissue, something like that. So this is about septal reconstruction. The, the, the article is about septal reconstruction. Uh, this, as I mentioned, this is on lay graft. And in, uh, when we need, let's say, two or three millimeter of uh, augmentation, it's better to use dice cartilage. I'm not now using dice cartilage. If I need more than two or three millimeters of graft, first I use such a rigid graft at the, at the base, then over it I use only dice cartilage. I'm just showing this, this is uh, dice cartilage in fascia, but I'm not using about four or five years this, uh, this method because I think uh, the fascia behaves as a barrier to the to the nutrition of the cartilage, so uh, I'm not using fascia anymore. Like in this patient, um, dice cartilage in fascia, but in time it loses uh, the volume. Um, so th there is this is a first from starting uh, simple cases, then a little bit um, relatively complicated cases. This is the simplest case. Many of ENT surgeons or many of many of plastic surgeons uh, can face such a problem. He had two previous septoplasties. The septum is weak, and when we look externally, there is a. Of course, it's not S like, but like may, maybe you can realize the deviation. So there is there is a narrow segment of septal cartilage. The caudal support is not enough. Uh, so there is a there is a sharp deviation at the key area, uh, so we need rib cartilage in this patient. This is basically septal reconst reconstruction and uh, a basic rhinoplasty, let's say. And when you see the profile wire, we, his nose is good enough. So if, the, if we perform any, an, any uncontrolled, uncontrolled maneuver, uh, his, um, his face will be more feminine let's say so it's we have to be careful about that because his nose is already uh, nice enough when we take the septum out there was a sharp deviation at the key area there is only a scar tissue but the, the height of the septum is not enough there is another angulation here so uh, we need strong um, let's say too long uh, Stress here. Ah, this is the summary of the costal cartilage as I showed you. It's it maybe just to remind you, I just reject the segment laterally, medially, elevate the posterior pericondrium, then reject this segment. I showed this patient's rib cartilage harvesting video. It's about four centimeter segment. This is the cross section. Then I just first I provide a, a hole at the caudal edges of the nasal bones then fixate this um, dorsal part of Elstrat to the nasal bones. And if there is a septal rest, of course, it's better to fixate it. Then 
the S strat, uh, the causal part of S strat, I, fi I just fixated them. Afterwards, I will fixate the, uh, the um, caudal part of S strat to the nasal spine. So the S strat must have to be fixated. Of course, already you know, but it's better to, to say it. it. It must be fixated around the anterior nasal spine and around the key area. The rest is standard columnar strut, etc. Not so important. So the nose is straight. Maybe I just I just shave this area one or one point five millimeters, something like that. Only relatively more or less sharp transition here, but that's it. And this is a sudden nose deformity, um, childhood trauma, uh, and previously septoplasty performed. I showed this patient's estrat reconstruction photo and dorsal nagraft previously. This is from operating table, and uh, the greens are, of course, the graphs as you as you know, the estrat reconstruction, and this is the result. As I mentioned. It's very important to camouflage the lateral edges of the dorsal leg graft so the, the, there will not be prominent transitions like this. This is uh, not difficult, but relatively, let's say, because uh, the, mm, we will see that two previous sonoplasties, uh, pinch nose like something like that, as you see. Basic, the basic mistake, let's say, is uh, there was long lateral curas and the surgeon uh, didn't shorten the lateral cura. He, he, he could perform lateral cura still, medial cura overlap or, or directly lateral cura overlap. So the patient needs lateral cura shortening. Uh, when you didn't, when you do not shorten the, the lateral cura, then the excess lateral cura uh, proceeds uh, medially like this. And of course there are, uh, there, um, the sutures tighten too much, as you see, Pinocchio-like appearance. And also the, 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 the key area attachment is not intact, as you see. If you see such a patient, there is a depression, there is an unnatural rotation or projection-like feeling. Um, you, you can easily realize that the key area, um, uh, the key area is not intact. So, we will reconstruct the septum and, and also support the lateral walls like this. He, he had uh, dermatitis, something like that at that period. So uh, with the curved coral strut grass, I just first lateral coral still, medial coral overlap to shorten the lower lateral cartilage, then support with the curved coral strut grafts with rib, of course. And uh, and the functionally it comes much uh, better, and the rest is reconstructing key area as I mentioned. So this patient is uh, there was retraction here. There is a scar laterally also here, and as you see the tip, I have video, so a short video about the patient. Here is a scar tissue actually, uh, about, probably you cannot realize it because the, the screen cannot show that problem. You can see it here, yes, like that. So uh, the, the dome area, of course it seems intact, but uh, not, uh, not normal, but uh, but still we can perform. We can use the same cartilage to to determine the new tip. Estrat reconstruction. First dorsal part of the estrat fixated uh, cephalically, then the caudal part of estrat fixated, and then fixated to the, of course to the nasal spine, shaving the excess, and just. You, probably you can see the uh, smooth convexity of the grass to open the nasal valves. Comalar strut. Mm -hmm. 
camouflaging with only two graft, infrared blur graft, and dorsal only graft dice cartilage with costal pericondrium. I'm using dice cartilage over it, costal pericondrium. The cartilage surface of pericondrium have to be faced to the cartilage again. The, the patient sent uh, her photos from a different city, so the, 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 the flash, everything is different. So this is the postoperative features. And I will not talk about that, but in such prominent facial asymmetries, it's very important to talk to the patient, the, to the problems. You see her right face is smaller than the left one. So you cannot correct this asymmetry. So you will correct everything, but the fa fa facial asymmetry will same. Uh, she has also septal perforation, three previous anaplasties. Uh, also, the key area is not intact, as you see. But as I mentioned, it's, I, I didn't put her video, so I will just. This is this is about septal perforation. If you are interested in, there is a technique uh, also like this. I just. Um, um, performed it many years ago. Uh, it, it works in spatial situations, of course. So it's not important. So this patient, I feel that this patient is relatively complex because she took two or three previous anaplasties, but uh, the surgeon used Metpor. Uh, so we have video, yes. So. The, you see the movement of the implant, and it's it's very important to to dissect very um, obsessively or in patients. Uh, so so at the end you 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 will feel that uh, yes you you can see the tip everything destroyed so there is no uh, continuity. Uh, of course, we, we will reconstruct it. We will reconstruct it separately or like an umbrella, etc. It, it depends on the skin skeletal uh, relationship. Um, here, metpore again, and dorsal only graft metpore. So uh, when we remove the graft, there is a there is a groove, uh, and at, around the around the implant, there is a capsule like. Um, formation, let's say, the, 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 the subcutaneous tissue uh, give reaction to such uh, foreign materials. So uh, you cannot reject uh, the, the fibrous tissue, etc. The skin quality is not enough. So in such patients, it's better to, to fill the groove with a similar uh, shape or similar volume. Uh, probably you can realize this groove like this, and because all the um, the periphery of the groove uh, covered with a with a fibrous tissue like uh, tissue, this is the rib, uh, and I I took uh, I I harvested another rib also. I will show that just anterior surface of a rib with perichondrium. Uh, first, reconstructing the uh, septum, uh, as you see in photographs, too much bleeding in such uh, patients. So, of course, I, I, I just think about it uh, and uh, plan different modifications. At last, I just uh, decided like this because the, I will combine the two, two lateral crural rests like an umbrella, so the lateral wall will be soft. Uh, of course, I can use separately. I can just bend the rib cartilage separately, dome, separate them. But in long term, it is uh, it, it is relatively hard to uh, know what will what the the behavior of the of the rib graft. So it will give the spring effect to the external nasal lobe. It's not, yes, this one. I just reject anterior surface of the sixth rib. One surface pericondrium intact. Other surface, I just carve it uh, nearly 
same shape uh, as the as the implant and then i performed multiple cuts like this pericondium is intact so so everything is together but uh, but uh, there are multiple segments the dorsum is not fixed the, the dorsum will be movable let's say the patient will not feel that and cover it with costal pericondrium and i just try to fill the uh, implants gap with such a material so uh, costal pericondrium pictures you see about the tip skin there was also uh, also the, the subcutaneous tissue reaction so we, we couldn't change the shape of the skin too much so this patient is relatively difficult than the previous one uh, so i think two operations previously there is a septal rest we have also a short video a deviation they, they performed base resections like this uh, so um, the the diameter is enough but if you try to reject the scar tissue here the, there will be further uh, narrowing so i just uh, said to the patient that i will not touch the nostrils because it, it uh, if we make it more narrower then there will be functional problems and the main problem is uh, small nose too much shortened we need to lengthen the tip increase projection but we need also to increase the dorsal height um, you cannot uh, understand from here but uh, genetically her eyes are too much apart from each other and if the dorsum uh, height is not enough then after the operation when you look her face you will realize the eyes are too too much apart from each other if your dorsum is relatively higher then you feel the eyes becomes closer so and we can do all all this um, all this volume uh, uh, volume difference just uh, the flexibility of the skin will determine how much we can lengthen the nose uh, increase the projection or uh, increase the height so we have a small short video let's say yes this is the video when we open the nose you see there is only scar tissue they resected this area there is no dome and also you see there is no upper lateral cartilage here just only scar tissue maybe there is a three millimeter something like that just caudally a separate island of cartilage that's it this is the uh, remaining septum first astral reconstruction then uh, fixate it as a caudal extension graft so we will push the tip forward and here I just perform partial uh, or something like uh, cuts so you see this this graft prepared with the curved blade and curved graft for lateral coral reconstruction and the, these turning points will behave as near tip defining points because uh, I don't uh, have any material to reconstruct a natural dome. So now I'm just making the angulations, etc., everything similar to each other with this. So this is the only septal cartilage from inside, the infraobular graph. These graphs will behave as uh, rim grass it is returned okay yes and this will just push the rim caudally costal pericondrium of course uh, yes this is the result uh, when we increase the projection and also uh, increase the length the the rounded nostrils become more elliptic as you see and the skin allowed this much lengthening and uh, i think the the difficult ones are she had two previous rhinoplasties the surgeon made a mistake let's say uh, relatively unexperienced uh, colleague so she has she had a fixed 
tip skin, she wanted a narrower tip. At the end of the operation, the, the tip uh, shape didn't change, so the surgeon panicked and, and performed resections from lateral aspects of the tip. As you see, skin resections from here, from here. Base resection, the scar comes, combines here. Also, the external incision, he also resected something here. So you see uh, the nostrils. Short nose, you can realize the these grooves. So uh, during the operation, I just performed the same incisions, and and in such patients, it's very uh, boring to elevate the uh, skin because every, there is just too much scarring. There is, there is, I'm just preparing a small uh, flap for the apex. So I'm just trying to mention that the main determining factor is the quality of skin and mucosa. So uh, in such cases, if we open in, in this nose, probably we cannot close it. You will see the, the tip color at the end of the operation. Uh, there is no blood circulation because the, the here is columnar incision. At the lateral aspects, there are scar tissues. So, so only there is a breach coming from dorsum. These are spreader grafts. Uh, I'm just inserted it into a tight pocket cephalically and caudally. I'm fixating the grafts, and then this is caudal extension graft, as you know. And afterwards, I will uh, I will realize that uh, uh, length of the the skin flexibility uh, will not enough. So I will shave some of the extensions from the caudal extension graft. This I think this operation was six or seven years ago. So. I'm just summarizing the incisions. Just perform incision like this. There is a mini flap for apex. There is a mini flap for base. Of course, inside there is there is postal cartilage graft supporting lateral wall. These are. Uh, in young patients, the costal cartilage, you can crush it, but uh, in, only in young patients. You see the color of the tip, just camouflaging, giving volume. And this is costal perichondrium. It will behave as a soft tissue pad under the, uh, and, uh, over the tip and under the uh, scar incision lines or scar tissue uh, areas. So these are the only septal cartilage, two separate separate septal cartilage. Maybe they can give two different light reflexes, something like that. In front of the graph, they will give um, uh, uh, length laterally and also give uh, this is 10 days postoperatively. Uh, the, the, these nostril retainers are very important. They are, they are important um, as the surgical maneuvers because uh, if the patient do not use this, then there will be uh, vestibular um, narrowing at the postoperative period. And during the day, about eight hours a day, uh, usually at least three months, but I usually advise this more than six months in such patients because the healing process goes on and in circular areas, it will co contract uh, much more in, in long term. So nose retainer is very important. Also, she sent it pictures from another country, let's say. There is, a, there is a hole, as you see. So this is not an aesthetic procedure, actually. This is an, this is an organ preservation procedure. And about the, about the profile view, as you see, um, the, the skin only uh, allowed 
this much uh, extension because they they, uh, they rejected. But the long term, uh, this this picture do not belong to the patient. I will show, but I I will show the long term uh, long term of the oblique split method graphs. I performed such rigid graphs and then over it disc cartilage in fascia. And after one year, the graft edges become a little bit visible because she had atrophic skin, etc., thin compromised skin. So this is the patient. So I will just uh, take them out and scrap with scalpel and then insert it back. Now, just to examine what will what the graft behavior after one year. It's very easy to dissect the graft because there, there is not too much uh, tight adhesion between the skin and costal cartilage. This is the graft after one year. Even the sharp bevel edges are clear. No absorption, no any change uh, of the shape. They are straight uh, after one year. As a summary, the, the cartilage stays straight in time. Just uh, scrap them and insert it back. Okay, so oblique split method provides straight grafts in varying thicknesses and primary limiting factor is quality of skin and mucosa. This is this is our uh, course uh, we, we are performing every each year, but the, this year due to pandemic we postpone it to 21 next year. Uh, these are, as I mentioned, the uh, social media addresses. Um, maybe I, I will also upload a few videos to the YouTube channel, maybe this talk also. So if you miss something, you can. But this is an in, uh, only an in, in, in interesting uh, quote about innovation uh, from Leonardo. But innovation, he says, life is pretty simple. You do some stuff. Most fails, some works. You do more what works. If it works big, others quickly copy it, then you do something else. And the trick is the doing something else. So from the from the colleagues or from the, from the listeners, they will do, of course, uh, interesting innovations, interesting new techniques. So the the only motivation to perform new things is is only doing something else. And uh, yes, okay. Do you have any questions? Okay. First of all, I, do, I would like to thank you a lot. You have such uh, incredible cases, uh, especially for those uh, really difficult ones or secondary and tertiary cases. Uh, I have some questions uh, from mine here, and then then I'm gonna open to my friends, and after that to the question area. Uh, but first, I, I would like just to invite everyone everyone here to follow us uh, on Instagram. It's it's called Rhinoplasty Talks. Every week we are gonna share another lecture there. So if you wanna keep following these lectures, just uh, follow us on Rhinoplasty Talks on Instagram. Uh, so professor. Uh, about your your oblique uh, oblique sp split method, uh, you plan you you use the cur the curve of the rib cartilage in order to have uh, a, a longer piece of oblique uh, piece. Okay. Uh, yes, of That's course. That's correct. Yes. So uh, how do you plan where to to place your cut the cut of the skin? Uh, do you use the the lateral uh, edge of the cartilage, or you just draw the, the cartilage in the, the patient's skin, and then you see where is the curve, and you inside uh, you cut uh, on this place. It is uh, actually I was talk about, but I couldn't mention enough. I think from here. Uh, So about um, anatomically, about 10 to 12 centimeters of this segment is cartilage. So 
if you uh, if you prefer to include the synchondrosis region, I usually prefer it. So it's better to perform the incision, uh, let's say about 10 centimeters, start from 10 centimeters laterally and 1.5 centimeters goes uh, medially. So uh, it means about, I will reject uh, around 10 centimeter laterally. My, my resection starts from this segment. Then I will, uh, maybe another picture is more suitable. Sorry. Could you share our screen? Are you showing us uh, any any picture right now? Uh, I will just show this uh, the same talk, so you okay. you can easily realize. So uh, so here. Um, I, first, I, I just palpate the direction of the rib, then I measure about 8 to 10 centimeters of a, a distance here. Uh, I said I will start from the 8 centimeter and go medially because the flap easily moves to medially. Uh, and then I just uh, include the synchronous region to the graft. Uh, while during cutting, during during the making the incision, rib incision, uh, I just imagine about four centimeters of a line and then first cut and parallel to it, the medial cut. And now I know that th there is a four centimeter length oblique surface, then about two centimeter of a block. It means, imagine that if you, if you will use one millimeter thickness, it means about nearly 15 or 20 uh, different grafts you will have on the operating table. So the basic idea is the lateral cut have to be um, the incision, the skin incision lateral edge is at the level of the rib segments lateral edge nearly because uh, the the flap cannot move laterally enough and but easily moves medially. That's it. Okay. Uh, what what kind of approach do you prefer for those primary cases? Because you showed us open and, and close approach for even primary and secondary ones. Do you have like a, a rule for you? Um, about close and open approach, you mean? Yes, uh, for primary cases, not for the secondary I, ones. Primary cases, I'm what? using, I'm, uh, primary cases, 90%, I'm, I, I prefer close approach because everything is clean, didn't touch before. So um, uh, at least 90% of cases uh, can be easily provided with close approach. But actually it's, it's not close, it's nearly open. I'm just trying to find that video. Uh, I have to find that video, sorry. First, I, I have showed this patient, but I, I, I will find the patient's video. A few words about closed rhinoplasty. Uh, so, about the incisions, infracartilage and use. Some, someone called this marginal incision, uh, like the external incision, you know, infracartilage and use. And you can add intercartilage and use, or you can perform only through the infracartilage and use incision all the rhinoplasty. This is this this idea actually belongs to uh, I, I I I don't know how I can pro pronounce it, but Guerrero Santos, I think from Mexico. It is from 1990. It's an article from that period. And when I saw this article between 27 to 2007, 2011, about four years, I performed this approach. So. This is, he performs only, only infracartilage incision. It, uh, it just go around the foot place and then uh, use this incision like this. So this patient I showed you, the, the, the video uh, I will show belongs to this patient. Now I just forget to, forgot to, 
find the video of that patient. So I will, first I have to find the video. Sorry. Eyeglass, okay. Probably this one. Uh, you, 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 uh, I think you cannot see the screen. I have to share, I think. So I have to share the screen. Can you see the can you see the video? No. Uh, can, can you see? Not the video, just the slides of you. Uh, okay, again, I will try again. Maybe I can stop share and then and then new okay. share maybe. Now, uh, yes. Sorry. I'm trying to share the screen. I'm just pressing the button, but why it is not working. Sorry. I'm pressing the share screen. It is written that host disabled participant screen sharing. Okay, how can I correct this? Uh, do you have any idea? Because I'm just try to, I just press the share screen. And, and then there is a there is a um, there is a hot host disabled participant screen sharing. sharing. Try again, please, Professor. Can you can you help? Um, Try again, right now. Uh, there is. Um, I think co the the co-host mode is going now, or only host. There is. I just press the screen, share. I just and press this one, then share. I think yes, you have yes. to see it now. Can you see? Uh, I think it's working. It, it's it's sharing. I just can 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 you see the screen now that there is a patient? No, we were, we were, it's written that you are sharing your your screen, but uh, we are seeing it's, just it's charging. Uh, it's charging. Yes, just a, a black screen here. Maybe it's maybe I, I will I will stop the video now. The same thing. I think you cannot see that now. The video no. started, but you cannot see that. I think. Yeah, it's not charging. Maybe try to unshare and share again. I don't know. Uh, Maybe I have to press. Yes. Can you uh, see? No. Now we have the video. I think it's work, yeah. Oh, yes. And let me just. Okay, sorry. I think it's it's working now. Okay. So this is just uh, I have recorded this few years ago just for presentations. So I performed uh, intercartagenous plus infracartagenous incisions, just uh, just to show a standard uh, approach. But uh, only infracartagenous incision is enough for uh, for this approach. The name of the article was written in the, at, the, at the PowerPoint. Uh, it is called Open Rhinoplasty Without Skin Columella Incision. 
and this is transfection incision and intercartagenous incision as i mentioned just to just to show a standard approach and i performed this incision about uh, three millimeters cephalic to the most caudal edge of the septum maybe you can realize that and this is for this is for canal dissection but it uh, I, I i don't uh, feel it is so important because um, it's the important thing is you have to be as much as closer to the perichondrium as i mentioned this is for uh, meetings so uh, if you are undermining under the perichondrium i mean you have to repair the, this area at the end of the operation because there is a tissue bulk uh, that is elevated from the scrotal region. Uh, if you are just over the perichondrium, uh, you, you, you usually do not need such uh, fixation, fixating sutures at the end of the operation. And upper lateral cartilage superchondrial Bony valve, of course, superior star, you know. So, this is, as you see, lateral core elevation. Uh, the question that actually mm, about the lateral cura, uh, of course you can elevate under perichondrium, but if you are under perichondrium, it's better to be over perichondrium around the middle cura region and around the accessory cartilage transition because the uh, superichondrial uh, elevation weakens the cartilage resistance about 20%. There are, uh, uh, there are um, articles about this this is um, i actually I, I do not want to be under perichondrium but the tip of the scissor uh, is under perichondrium so i'm trying to go over perichondrium around this region because i don't want to uh, weaken the cartilage so uh, i elevate laterally elevate this part and then and then combining the the dome segment. Here you see, I'm just trying to be over perichondrium here because I elevate here just under perichondrium. So elevating everything, detaching everything. This is the pitang ligament, but I, I prefer to uh, to 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 reject uh, the pitang ligament. You see that like this, and at the at the end of the operation, according to the need, I can just uh, put an absorbable suture from the uh, subcutaneous rest to the to this rest. I just cauterize this pitangular rest, so it 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 behaves as about two millimeter resection of pitangular because in this patient there will be uh, there will be a long uh, pitangular or something like that rest. I'm just preparing that area. These edges are intercartilaginous incision corners. So this is the pitangular rest at the columellar side. I'm just talking about. It is better to be over perichondrium around uh, middle crura. Uh, if you are under perichondrium lateral crural part, it's better to be over perichondrium here, as you as I mentioned. And also, it's better to be over around the accessory cartilage junctions. This is only for for recording the video. Too much uh, surgical pen. 
So the 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 cephalic resection must be just enough to give the desired shape. shape. So it's very important to to control the potential space. If if there is an if there is uh, more potential space, it means there will be more scar contracture at the post period. You see, these are the natural uh, domes. These are just to just to show uh, to the to the audience. Uh, so uh, during the operations, you can use small dots only, not too much ink here. So uh, as I mentioned, you just imagine uh, the shape of the lateral cura and then uh, less potential space between the lateral cura cephalic edge. Uh, so very minimal resection of the of, of spheric resection. Then first I just determine a symmetric symmetric two points uh, on the cartilages. Then I just uh, I just imagine how much I will steal. Of course uh, I will just mimic it with a with a brown forceps something. So uh, from literally I, I just repeatedly um, bend it again again examine it and then i just i, I have decided that this this uh, tip point will be uh, suitable for this patient because when you uh, when you still laterally uh, the everything will change uh, you have to consider of course rotation projects and etc but there are some things have to be concerned uh, the uh, the, the, the skin will adapt to the new skeletal shape or not. This is, that's, it's, it's also so important. So it is, uh, it's not a complicated thing, but uh, it is not only just looking from profile view and, view and then just, just, just decide, it's, it's not like that. Uh, so when we bend the cartridge from, uh, from the lateral, lateral aspect, then and the more wider portion of the lateral crura becomes mm, uh, the near uh, tip defining point region. So we have to provide the domal notch here as in natural one, but still we didn't perform middle crura overlap. So there is, there is, you see, there is, um, there is uh, too much skin that is not supported by skeleton now. Uh, and this is only a preliminary tip, let's say, just uh, just to uh, to be sure about the profile view, how much hump I will reset. When I just uh, separate the cartilage from septum, then elevate the septal mucosa. Uh, this is component resection, of course, as you know, uh, separately. I mean, so uh, when we when we separate the apolateral cartilage, of course, we have to uh, we, we have to repair that area. I mean, we have to use spreader grass. The, this is this is a present from my friend. This is Boris Boris elevator. Uh, so uh, you see fracture lines near the plant hump resection segment. There is a fracture line, traumatic nose. So I just reject the uh, uh, segment like this and i i know my hand i always i with my eyes i see that i'm i'm performing uh, resection symmetrically but i know that i will uh, it's not symmetric i know that at supportive region i will left about one 1.5 millimeter of cartilage then i will reset it again so when you look with your eyes that and then you are sure that you are performing a maneuver symmetrically um, actually, it's not symmetric, so you have to be aware your um, your own uh, let's say mistakes of your eyes or perception of your eyes or hands. Actually, you know these steps. So let's say talk about uh, either base narrowing on left side of the patient. You cannot make a symmetric resection, but on right side. I'm, I can work more symmetrically. So I, I just perform left side first, then just copy to the right side. 
So you have to be uh, aware of your hand skills or, or, or your perceptions, actually. The same thing is true for the transesostotomy line, as I talked during the ostotomy section. So you are thinking that you are performing an, an, an um, exactly axial plane, but it is not actually axial plane. The lateral aspect of the transesostotomy becomes more cephalically. The same, actually, I can, we can pass. Yes, this is photograph preparation. Just shaving the um, anterolateral aspects of the grass. Maybe I can show that part again, sorry. Here, the, this area will be anterolateral aspect of the spreader grass. So the, the dorsum will be more rounded. You see the caudal septum. This is caudal septum, but the, it is uh, crooked or there are deviations, sharp deviations. So we are straighten, straightening it with a graft. Spreader grass, fixating them. You see, I just shaved this area, so the dorsum will be more rounded. And the fixation of the spreader grafts are uh, about one millimeter lower than the septum. So at the end, when we uh, close the roof, the, um, there will be more or less spring effect, not, uh, not, uh, not a perfect natural dorsum, but, uh, but uh, anyone can, can understand that it is, it is um, uh, it's, uh, let's say, trinoplasty or something like that. So you see the apolateral is, we are just measuring the excess apolateral, then I will, uh, I will show when I, I will close the dorsum. Now, the, 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 when we, um, where we have to, um, we, we, we have to overlap this area, it's actually uh, about uh, six to six to eight millimeters caudal to the new, new uh, dome. And also, it's it is in, interestingly, it is at the level of the level of the uh, intercrural ligament attachments. Actually, there is there is also anatomic landmarks. Also, just a just an approximately five, uh, six to eight millimeters caudal to the needle. So uh, this is a little bit nearer than expected according to his his anatomy because there was too much um, uh, unsupported area around the uh, caudal margin. Maybe you can, you realize that uh, the, mm, the, the dome, uh, the nurse uh, hold the cartilage and bends and there is a dome and then I just, uh, I just fixate the suture. These are excess uh, edges when you check on the, on the lateral view. And also you are just mimicking the natural domal notch here. And then of course, resecting, let's say less than, less than millimeter modifications. This is important, I think. This is not actually a excess cartilage or dog ear, etc. This is for this is for weakening the cartilage um, at the near uh, tip defining point. So uh, when we when we think about the whole lower lateral cartilage, the most uh, weakest point is the near dome now. Otherwise, you see the the previous suture is not uh, it, it is it is relaxed and we do not need it. So. Actually, I will not use. Uh, uh, I, I, I'm, I'm only using just just closing the closing the resected gap. That's it. And then I will just reject the the first suture. This it is only for um, for to um, define the new dome during the operation. But at the end of the operation, I will uh, I will just reject it as you see, closing all the. Uh, uh, all the, the ligaments or tissues. 
because we we have open that area to to have a better exposure stratcraft stratcraft actually of course you can use it in a longer way but i'm not using the columnar strat uh, longer it it usually do not uh, do not reach to the foot plate levels because it 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 just uh, behaves as a as a fixation material the the two mid medial and uh, middle chorus fixated to this structure so that will that they will behave as a as a symmetric or as a as a mono unit structure just checking the angulations etc uh, so this is six or pds uh, you can of course you can um, it's better to to hide the nut inside, but this is six OPDS and it will be under the flap, so there will not be any problem. Maybe very few patients may feel uh, feel it, but after one month they, they they will not feel anything. But here it is on the bare cartilage surface and will be covered with the flap. At these two different fixation sutures. And this this small needle is for do not uh, tightly uh, fixate the suture because if you are uh, if you are suturing very tightly it means that you, you can cause um, asymmetries and our the, the 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 right and left side of the patients um, inherently they are asymmetric so if you if you tightly suture something you you will cause iatrogenic asymmetry actually. So there will be a, let's say one 1.5 millimeter of relaxation. So the skeleton will, will be more symmetric. These are excess tissues around that region. These are infralobular grafts, let's say, filling that gap. So the, the columnar flap uh, will not um, fill that place. Uh, uh, the, the volume of this graft uh, have um, more effect uh, of, um, how can I explain that? Let's say if you put a one millimeter thickness of a graft, uh, it behaves according to the soft tissue structures more than one millimeter graft because there is soft tissue and they will not they will not go into this groove. Uh, so this, this grass will behave as they are more larger or more thicker. So uh, after a point, uh, after a step, you will start to examine the uh, subcutaneous tissue uh, modifications or subcutaneous tissue reactions. So you will shave very millimetrically some parts, then there will be more smooth transition around the infralobular region. This is about lateral osteotomy. As I mentioned, a separate groove at the beginning of the talk. It's only about, let's say, three millimeter uh, width of tunnel. This is a three millimeter also microosteotomy. This is the level of the osteotomy, as you see. Uh, so the osteotome must be sharp enough. It's very important, uh, especially in such a man, if you perform uh, too much um, mobile or collapsed lateral walls, uh, everything will not be seen naturally. You, you saw this video, uh, I think two times previously. So everything is mobile, but do not collapse uh, too much. So this is important, you see, uh, just only a simple suture but when you close the suture there will be a spring like effect and uh, the lateral wall will be more naturally round let's say we have elevated this area uh, superconductor during superconductor elevation so you have to you have to repair that area if you are under under periconductor so this is a uh, um, this is think that uh, there, there was a columnar, um, columnar uh, 
we are fixating the the columella to the cardinal septum, of course, but there was a three-dimensional groove between the membranous columella, so we, we fixate it to the caudal septum for uh, preserve the uh, projection. Uh, so actually, uh, I have, I think I, I, I showed the patient's pre or post -op pictures. If you want, I can, I can uh, find it again. No, no, no problem. We... Dr. Tustin, may I ask you just one of question? Uh, whenever you have to add height to the dorsum, you don't need, don't you don't use uh, that big pieces of uh, costal cartilage? Then you you prefer to to use uh, add pieces of the oblique split method. I don't know if I, I was. Uh... Here. You mean, um, if your you question need is about uh, dorsal augmentation with yes. read. Uh, can you repeat the question? You, you mean uh, when you use dust cartilage, when I use um, intact rib segment, you, you, mean, you mean that question? No, I mean, if, if you need uh, a lot of augmentation, like three, four millimeters, okay. you never use the, the, the big piece. You use the, the, the oblique split. Uh, one. First, um, uh, when, when I need more than, uh, more than three, three millimeter of augmentation, let's say. Yeah. First, first um, at the base, there is rigid rib cartilage. Over it, about two millimeter of uh, diced cartilage, and over it, rib cartilage pericondrium. So, because um, if um, if you are if you are using only a rigid cartilage, uh, a large block of dorsal only graft, uh, at long postoperative period, the the borders, the transitions from lateral wall to the graft or uh, on, the, on the dorsum also, there, there will be some um, protrusions or depressions, let's say, because it is, uh, how can I explain? It is not always related to the surface of the ulnar graft. It is also related to the subcutaneous, um, subcutaneous layer because such patients had already uh, two or three previous operations there are irregular scarring. So the, the flap, uh, when we look at the lateral view, just, just, just imagine that, the flap thickness is not homogeneous. So uh, there are some, some irregularities at the flap actually, because there are two or three layers of scar tissue and uh, even you perform uh, very controlled resections, it will not become really homogeneous. So, uh, it is important to use the rib pericondrium as a as a uh, soft tissue padding, and under it there are dice cartilage. So there will the dice cartilage will fill the fill the irregularities under the flap, and at the base the rigid cartilage. Uh, in the past, I'm, I was using of course rigid one block cartilage, but um, at long long postoperative period the borders are more or less uh, not barely or clearly visible, but, but visible. So I, I camouflage the lateral aspects, use the rigid cartilage over it, about two millimeter uh, thickness of dorsal on graft, less cartilage and uh, brief pericondrium. Okay. Uh, we have many good questions from the audience. Could you ask some of them? Um, of course, I'm I'm listening. Yeah. Okay. Let me see here. Here is a question about the rip oblique method angulation. It doesn't matter. It is the okay. only 
only the cross section of the rib. You can cut 45 degrees, 60 degrees, etc. It, it is it is unrelated from the from the um, angulation. But if the rib segment is really uh, curved one, then at the most uh, distal ends of the graft, let's say one or two millimeter of distal ends, there may be a small uh, bending tendency because just imagine one side is the peripheral side and the other side is less stronger than the peripheral side. So peripheral sides tends to contract to, to, to the periconium side. I mean, if the rib is too much um, uh, arc formation, then when you cut obliquely at the tip, one or two millimeter tip, there, there may be min minimal tendency, then you just reject it because you have four centimeters of a graft, you can reject the tip two millimeter, it's not important. So angulation is not important. And uh, uh, there's a question from, colleague, I mean, uh, piezo device for harvesting rib cartilage. Uh, pneumothorax, he, he asked that doesn't it minimize as much as possible the risk of pneumothorax? Uh, pneumothorax, uh, and when we compare with other devices or in instruments, and he added that because of selectiveness of piezo to the bone cartilage tissue, etc. So actually, many colleagues are saying that uh, piezo do not cut soft tissue, etc. Of course, do not cut soft tissue. If you if you if you put it to your fingertip, it will not cut it. But if there is a, if there is resistance, if the tissue is a part of a rigid structure, let's say, if it is if it is part of a stable or rigid rib, then it it, it can also cut the periconium because it it depends on the and the flexibility of the tissue. If the, if the tissue is not flexible, then it will tear. If the tissue moves with the vibration, then it will not cut. So uh, actually, I, 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 did, I, did, I do not remember, but six years ago, I have, I have used uh, in few patients piezo device during rib harvesting. So uh, after that, I, I didn't feel that it is it is helping me. And instead of I, I just I just designed an an angulated uh, so as I showed you. Uh, uh, what was the problem? How, how can I explain it? Let's say I can change the question like this: In rib cartilage harvesting or rib cartilage patients, when we need piezo instrument, if the rib segment is um, ossified, then it is better to have a piezo or an, an electrical instrument because it is not difficult to harvest uh, the, the graft from the bed. It is difficult to carve the graft on the operating table. So in uh, ossified, in patients having ossified rib segments, I um, designed the graft at the chest bed and then I just reject it with the with the hand saw as I showed you. But if you have piezo in the operating room, so you can use piezo if the rib is ossified. Uh, otherwise, it is um, as my colleague mentioned, it has not any advantage about uh, uh, about preserving the uh, the the pleura. I think because when you when you touch it, 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 it can cut also the posterior periconium because it, 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 it do not move. I have experienced about it. I, um, six or seven years ago, I, I, as I mentioned also, I, I, I think I shared it on Instagram, just, uh, just, uh, just a different thing, but uh, I, I do not need that. If you are using Piozo, um, please be careful that, um, uh, you can, you cut the freely cut the rib and then when the piezo comes to the pericorium, then it will stop. No, it, it, it will not stop. Uh, if the, uh, as I mentioned, if the tissue is moving with the vibration, it will not cut. If the tissue is strictly adhered to the structure, then it, it can cut the pericorium also. 
But this is not a, not a disadvantage. This is just, if you are aware of this, that's it. Then you, you, you will be careful about that. Um, I'm not mm -hmm. against piezo or micromotor, everything. I'm just, uh, we have naturally touch and pressure sensation at our fingertips. So um, you can do same maneuvers with different instruments. And when I use electrical instruments due to vibration, I, I didn't like too much. And about the, um, about the heat production, uh, it is not so much suitable for closed approach because the primary cases I perform 90% closed approach. So um, I can do same thing even in a better controlled manner I can do with the hand saws. So metal is strong than the bone. You can cut the metal. You, you can cut the bone with a metal. 0.4 millimeter hand saw is uh, very easy to use. That, that, that's the idea. Uh, otherwise, I'm not a fan of any instrument, actually. Uh, but um, I'm just trying to, we have to talk about, uh, uh, when we talk about techniques, instruments, etc., uh, we have to talk about the advantages and disadvantages, not only the advantages, anything. Um, about, and the, the second, other question, uh, how, how do you, cephalic part of estrat reconstruction, uh, where do you suture the cephalic part of the estrat? If there is a septal rest around the key area, of course, it's better to fixate cephalic part as a spreader graft, as, as the same manner as, as spreader graft fixation. Uh, but if you don't have any um, rest, then uh, I provide a hole at the caudal end of the nasal bone. But just imagine that it's about Let's say, imagine the most caudal end of the nasal bone, then about four or five millimeters more cephalically. And with a, uh, with a large needle tip, I, I, I just use uh, my hand motion, just rounding the needle, and then I just provide the hole. If you have piezo, you can provide that hole with a piezo. Piezo actually is useful in such situations, providing a hole or after the after the lateral osteotomy, you can shave the small protrusions, etc. So, uh, and uh, we have a hole now at the caudal part of nasal bone. Uh, we have the um, we have two uh, two grafts like think that like a spreader graft. Then I just determine the which. Uh, the depth, the localization of the suture plant suture pest points. So uh, first, um, first, let's say you can just pass from the bone, then you can pass uh, the cephalic ends of the graft, just uh, the determined localization. And then uh, you can easily fixate it, just, just a primary suture. It's uh, for or PDS, of course, that's it. Uh, of course, you can fixate, um, um, you can use more suture. This is the first suture to fixate, of course. Um, Excuse me, professor. Okay, I'm listening. Can, can, we, can we go for the question area because we have uh, like an order there? Can you, I see, think it's more... can you see my screen? And now I'm... Or... Yes, I'm still looking at your screen. Yes, so... Uh, there are, um, I, I just come to the top of the uh, questions. Um, the, the, first, the first question here. But it's not in the order, right? Can, can, you, can you read the first question? Uh, are we uh, yes. looking to the same things? Uh, the first one here, uh, uh, Lissandro Martins wants to know, uh, about your complications with rib removal. Which ones did you have and uh, how did you conduct? How did you solve the, uh, save the, solve the problems? Um, 
about the harvesting complications he he said yes, yes. the first question about yes. about harvesting um uh, actually uh, really I, I i i do not remember how many rib cartilage i have taken because nearly half of patients are revision cases and uh, nearly 80 percent of patients are rib cartilage cases so uh, really too too many uh, cases i uh, i uh, harvested rib but i didn't face any promotorax uh, so maybe it's about my obsession maybe something happened by uh, but but i didn't uh, realize that uh, of course I, I i i realized that so even now when i'm turning to the posterior perichondrium uh, I'm a little bit more 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 uh, obsessive to be under the perichondrium, to be at the cartilage side. So uh, there will be no such a complication. Uh, it's better to less experienced surgeons to to use the seventh cartilage, seventh rib. Um, and uh, about the bleeding. Uh, at the postoperative period, I was using the the drains in the past, uh, but even uh, I had totally maybe in three patients hematoma, something like that. Mm -hmm. But when I opened the uh, surgical bed after, let's say, two or three days, uh, etc., I couldn't find any any bleeding uh, source. So there was seroma-like connection. connection those patients are mainly due to uh, uh, when you when you resect fascia when you use rectus fascia the the cartilage fibers uh, are bare so there are some irritation seroma formation etc so uh, just uh, i use uh, i don't know the english word but I use compression uh, for few days on the uh, on the bed, so so the the serum uh, formation uh, resolves. So I'm not using drain maybe last. I'm not sure, but last maybe six years I'm not using drains. Uh, just at the and about uh, and about resorption of those rib grafts. What, what do you think are the calls and how to avoid rib, rib resorption? The, 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 the rigid grafts do not resorb actually. If you are fixating the rigid graft with a vacuum, let's say, uh, absorbable material, then the reaction of, to the suture material will also affect, may also affect the cartilage, may. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure. But when we talk about uh, dice cartilage, it's different because if the when the diameter of the dice cartilage increases, when the volume increases, then the center uh, cannot um, cannot nourish or cannot uh, blood cannot enough at that uh, area. So it's better to use less than three millimeter thickness. And if you are using that's okay, kind of right. fish, yeah? You have to be aware of that the behavior of the barrier to the cartilage uh, nutrition, let's say. Uh, so uh, I didn't face uh, a major absorption, actually. Yes, maybe in the past, maybe one or two um, unknown infection, let's say. Uh, but um, at a point, you can control it with the antibiotic solutions, drainage, etc. But uh, I didn't have uh, really a big complication about that. If you okay. use very huge bulk of dice cartilage, something will be absorbed. If you are using it in Asia, some of them will be absorbed. Uh, here, Guilherme is asking, how how do you do those? Double lateral osteotomies for axial deviation. I, I think we had already answered that. Uh, yes, uh, this is for deviated noses. Uh, let's say the nose is deviated to my left side like this. 
so this area is uh, there is a, there is a segment uh, longer than left side so usually there is also a protrusion lateral to the lateral osteotomy line so after lateral osteotomy, if, when you perform lateral osteotomy, it is hard to insert or use rasps at that area because there may be more unstabilization of the nasal bone. So before the lateral osteotomy, I first use rasp and I provide a smooth transition as much as possible. Then uh, with a, with a uh, three millimeter osteotomy, the, the bone becomes thinner, of course, because I rasp that area. With a, with a three millimeter marker osteotome, first I just perform the superior cut and then uh, the and then the lateral cut, let's say, or the or the or the base cut. So it it is in uh, if the basic problem is the axis deviation, the the upper the, the superior cut is in a coronal plane. The, I'm just talking about the cut of the plane. It the the first cut the superior one is at coronal plane. The inferior one is uh, is a little bit sagittal. Yes, relatively sagittal. If you, okay. if you want more more uh, height, loss, then more sagittal. And as you rest that area, it is very easy to perform the osteotomy because the bone uh, tint. Another thing you can. Yeah, another question here. Uh, how, how many minutes do you have, guys, for the questions? I'm going to follow the order here. Um, uh, from Mexico, uh, there, uh, he, he asked, uh, maybe, uh, do, you, do you fixate the bone in new position? Only in such cases, we need to fixate new position or. Uh, Let's say the previous osteotomy performed in a in a higher manner, uh, and uh, and the nasal bone collapsed. So I know that may maybe I need fixation. So let's say, can you see my hand? Yes. Let's say this is the left side, a higher level of bony collapse previously. So I provide the whole uh, lateral part, also medial segment. There are two holes, and then afterwards, I very I just provide a movement in very controlled manner. I mean, with the saw, I just cut the uh, previous um, fracture line, and then provide a gap, then easily open the superior segment or medial segment. I mean, so uh, I just fixate it with a with an absorbable suture, just transcutaneously, just go from outside to the septum then go from septum to the to to the nasal bone side then just just a simple suture uh, actually it, it it works but if if you need to fixation after mobilization then you need piezo so this just a plan uh, just you are suspicious that you would need fixation then provide two holes uh, at the end of the operation, maybe you don't fix, you don't need fixation. It's not important. There are two needle holes. It's not important. But if you need, the 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 holes must be ready. Otherwise, you need uh, you need an electric instrument. And how do you often refresh your macrostotoms? I think uh, for forty or fifty times is um, ideal, but. I'm using more than 100 cases actually. It depends on how, how you keep the osteotomes. If your nurse is careful about cleaning and keeping the uh, tips uh, intact uh, or, or during sterilization process, then you can use them really even 100 cases, but, uh, but, uh, but 40 or 50 times is optimum, I think. Uh, if the tips become blunt, uh, um, uh, a man can sharpen the tips, but not uh, not us, of course. We need a hand, hand, handcraft man to sharpen the tips. And also, uh, how do we uh, how do we resting there? How do we elevate superior superior steadily? It's 
So under periosteum, you, you can elevate. Um, for radix modification, which microsoft? I'm using the convex one for, for all of them. Um, if you are, I'm not writing, but I'm just uh, reading and answering them. Um, if you are going, uh, Dr. Lesandro Martins, if next, you are going to under... The next one, I, I think we already... Okay, he asked, uh, do you use piezo or osteotomy? If you, if you have a rhinoplasty, which one you choose? Osteotomy, of course. And, and Dr. Tastan, uh, uh, how long does the your soles? How, how long do you, how many surgeries do you use the same soles? You have to change that? We answered it. We have answered it actually. Uh, I'm using maybe 100 times, but it's more optimum about 40 or 50 cases. But if you keep the tips uh, carefully, more than 100 cases. And if they become blunt, you can sharpen it. A handcraftman may sharpen it. Um, and there is, is there a video about osteotomies and revision? Of course, but uh, we, we are talking too much now. We, of course, there are too many videos. And yes. does it make sense to equalize bony sides by removing some bony from the long lateral nasal bone? Uh, of course, but we are talking about not resecting a segment. We just make the osteotomy and then just just uh, just push it or move it in a in a classic osteotomy way. We are not we are not talking about a res resection of a segment. Uh, so uh, if you are resecting a segment, it's it is uh, a little bit more. Um, you have to be more careful about that. But we are not talking about that. So let's see. Maybe more two questions because I think it's yes, <laughs> too late, late for you, Professor. Yes. Uh, I think. Yes. Uh, let me see here. Uh, I'm uh, a friend of mine, uh, Halit Urgan. He's a really good surgeon, uh, really good man, and really good surgeon. He asked that do you use tampons to support the nasal bone? Uh, actually, uh, I my my idea is to support the nasal bone. I'm using Doyle nasal splints, silicone splints to to support the, the the nasal bone. Many of my colleagues using transeptal suturing, but uh, they are happy with that. But I think if you are if you perform lateral osteotomy, and if it is um, not stable enough in most of the cases, not stable enough, it's better to support medially. It, uh, about two days or three days is will, will be enough, at least one day actually. Uh, if if you do not use uh, such a support, uh, I think there will be there will be a little risk. I think, but as I mentioned, many of my colleagues are happy about that. Um, I am a little bit obsessive surgeon. I I, I prefer to support. And okay, you can great. ask the other questions. Yes, let's see a, a last question here. Uh, we have the same questions here. Let me see a different one. Uh, and another colleague, Haluk Bilek, he's also a good surgeon from Turkey. Uh, about nose retainers, all, uh, all, after all revision cases do you use uh, always? Not always, but if you if you reconstruct the lateral crawl area, not not only a, only a alar button or or uh, simple simple uh, simple grafting, um, if you reconstruct everything at lateral crawl uh, bed, uh, it's it's better to use it. Uh, but in uh, in skin or soft tissue problems, it's uh, in such patients, of course, always. You you can ask okay. me. I'm just reading from the uh, screen and the. Uh, okay. 
Actually, Professor, I think we we have already had almost three hours of your time. Uh, we have actually more, like 20 questions more here, but I think we we don't have uh, enough time for all of them. If there's interesting ones, you can uh, choose them. So uh, uh, maybe because if they ask, hey, you, you can answer it. it Another colleague from Turkey, Kanipchi, he is a good surgeon also. He asked about surge cell warp dice cartilage. Surge cell uh, uh, causes a foreign material reaction. And uh, when you use surge cell as a warping material, there will be much more absorption of the graft. So I'm not using it for many years. I, I do not remember. Maybe, maybe 15 years I'm not using it. More than 50 years. Okay. Do you guys have any questions there? Dr. Tastan, when you do the, 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 the close approach, do you preserve the, the, the posterior struts like Dr. Shaki? I'm not, I'm not preserving posterior strut. Uh, Dr. Chakur is my friend. He is a good surgeon, of course, you know. Um, so uh, it's about. Uh, then we think about the, the, the ligaments, the support mechanisms between the columella and the caudal septum. Uh, there is a, maybe, let's say, five to eight millimeters of an, of an area is during hemitransfiction or transfiction incision, during your first rhinoplasty after this talk, just, just pay attention to that area. There is a bulk of tissue and its width is about let's say fifth, five to eight or nine millimeters of, uh, of a width, there, are, there is a bulky tissue. There, it, is, it is attachments between the columella and septum. So uh, the, 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 if you provide a, if you perform the, the mucosal incision, just cephalic to the, let's say, think about the most caudal part of the septum, about three or four millimeters just cephalically. Then if you perform the incision, there will be a groove inside the columella. Then you will fixate that groove to the caudal part of the septum. So you will, you will three-dimensionally fixate the columella to the caudal septum. But when we think about only um, one millimeter of a, uh, of a strip, then at the same time, we, we are assuming that all the or most of the strong ligaments or structures attaching to one or two millimeter region. Actually, it's, it's attaching a more wider region. But, uh, but of course, we, we cannot uh, rely only on the one, uh, one part of support structures. Uh, so it's, uh, I think it, both ways are working well. I, I, I prefer the, the three-dimensional columnar groove fixation to caudal septum. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Oh, yeah. Pro professor, I, I think we have just one more, the last question here. Okay. Uh, uh, two, two people here are asking the same thing. Uh, what's your opinion, opinion about preserving and repairing the pitangi ligament and also the scroll area? Actually, uh, this is if you are if you are preserving, uh, so it is it's a, it's a different uh, exp, uh, the explanation may be a little bit confusing. It depends on the let's say the the, the uh, there is a uh, there is a large hump, there is a droopy tip, there is a long nose. Then in such patients, there will be too much uh, too much. Uh, ligament and uh, soft tissue, uh, soft tissue volume around the supratip region. So in such cases, I prefer um, I prefer to resect that area, and if I need, I can just close the supratip gap with a with an absorbable suture. Or, or if there is a thick skin, I prefer to resect a very controlled manner of subcutaneous or pericone, including pericondrium, uh, something, uh, or pericondrium and near tissues, let's say, or fatty tissues, and then just provide or put a subcutaneous suture to the, to the underlying skeleton just to close the gap. 
but if there is a thin skin patient, if the, the, the modifications will not be too large, then you can preserve or um, you can just cut and repair again. Uh, but uh, if, you, if you are working under perichondrium around the upper lateral and scroll region, you have to repair that area. If you are over perichondrium, it depends on the case, but usually it is not uh, mandatory to repair. But if you are under, you have to repair scroll area and also the also the suprative region or pitango rest. So uh, this is about preference. Let's say some surgeons prefer to be under and to repair that area. Uh, and uh, even we can talk about let's say 15 or 20 minutes about but only scroll area. But um, we are we are providing a new skeleton. Then the skeleton to skin uh, relationship changes actually. So if you are over and just think like that, you you, you just you just uh, if you are under perichondrium, even I just elevate under perichondrium, I perform multiple cuts to the perichondrium flap. I mean, so the flap a little bit flexes and then more uh, more easily shapens the new skeleton or uh, or takes the shape of the new skeleton so uh, it's about as I mentioned preference I I usually prefer uh, to be just over perichondrium but when a, when an uh, observing surgeon looks to the surgery he thinks that I am under perichondrium but actually I'm not under so you, you have to be as close as possible to the perichondrium. And all, I think all the other audiences or all the colleagues have to answer this question. Perichondrium is a part of the cartilage or is a, is part of the flap? If you can decide about this, you can answer that question actually. Some say that it's, it is a part of flap, but according to me, it's, it, it belongs to cartilage. Great. It's a different point of view of this because uh, preserving and repairing scroll ligaments and going over and under uh, the, the perichondrial, it's uh, such a, a subject discussed right now. And uh, I really like it, your point of view. And in my opinion, it belongs to the cartilage also. Yes. Uh, that 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 area there there will be a tissue bulk if you if you preserve so you have to control that tissue bulk also uh, you have to be experienced about controlling that tissue bulk around the suprative region uh, and uh, different patients gives different responses to preserving that area also different patients gives different responses when you do not preserve so you have to be aware of the skin skeletal relationship actually great uh there i think it's midnight right now yes professor it's like uh, okay thank you so i would like to thank you a lot for this uh, amazing lecture we are here for three hours lear learning from you uh we are so excited for because of that so i would like to thank you a lot do you have thank to you. do you want to say anything my friends no, thank you. Uh, stay safe. Yes, nowadays, stay safe. <laughs> thank you. Yes, the most important thing. Thank, so, thank you very much, Dr. Tastan. Fantastic lecture and so creative. Solve, uh, you solve your problems with some creative techniques. It's, it's awesome. See how you, how you work. Uh, thank it's, you. It's, nice, nice to meet you all again. Thank you. Maybe, thank you maybe, very much. Maybe, Have a nice evening. Once more. Bye bye. Thank okay. Closing. Thank you. Bye. Thank bye, you. bye bye. Have a bye. great weekend. Bye bye. Bye bye everybody. Thank you again for your presence, bye. all the audience, and so you we see you next next weekend.